You are about to hear Dr. T.L. Osborne of Tulsa, Oklahoma, USA. T.L. has already shared the gospel to millions of people in more than 80 nations of the world. He has seen miraculous signs and wonders again and again as he teaches the truth of Jesus Christ. Now in this recording, you will experience the anointing of Dr. Osborne's powerful ministry firsthand as he shares this dynamic message. The ministry of healing the sick. I'm so thankful that I can be a part of it. After all of these years going all over the world, it's wonderful to be able to share with you. You count with God. And I think it's significant that you and me cross paths. I believe that God has a purpose for your life. Why would he have brought you along at this time to hear what this man T.L. Osborne has to say to you? Why would he have brought you along to be one to be part of the first course that we've given on tape. I think God has big ideas for you, and I pray that today this lesson number 11 will be an uplift and a strengthening to your faith. As you know, our textbook is Healing the Sick, the Living Classic, written 1949 and 50, unchanged through the years. It has stood the test. It's standing the test today. Tens of thousands have been healed while reading it. You can get them and pass them out to the sick. I wish every Christian that knows about it would keep ten. And then visit the hospitals and the shut-ins and give them to ten incurable people. Go back and check on them every two or three days so when they're healed you can get your book and pass it on to someone else. Tell them now you don't need it. You can buy one on your own. <laughs> It's the truth that sets people free. So we read from Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, as our scriptural base for today. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, or Jesus as Lord, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart... Man or woman believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Let me just throw in here, there are just two things about our Christianity, our faith and our ministry. What we believe and what we do about it. We believe that God raised Jesus from the dead and that Jesus is Lord, and what do we do about it? Tell it. Share it. Confess it. Some folks interpret that to mean that when you believe on Christ, then you stand before some preacher or kneel at some altar and you say, Now I believe, Lord, that you saved me. Thank you. That's their confession. Nonsense. That's not the point. The point is, if you believe it, get busy and tell it. Confess it. Use your lips. Use your tongue. Spread the news. That's all there is to Christianity. What you believe and what you do. Well, I've been doing what I believe for a long time, and I plan to do it for a long time yet. Almost 70 countries, over three decades already. That's terrific, isn't it? I think that's worth flaunting. <laughs> Let's take a little trip to Africa and take a day in this gospel according to T. Ellen Daisy. <laughs> you know. There's a gospel of Mark and a gospel of John. They told about Jesus in their way. Paul talked about his gospel, and T.L. and Daisy are writing a gospel. We record it as we go. You're writing a gospel every day. Let's go over to page 352 in your textbook. We've logged a lot of wonderful stuff for you. Ibadan, Nigeria. Oh, what a meeting today. It was amazing. This is the largest all-African city on the continent of Africa. I preached on why Jesus came. That's a good subject. A vast company of people believed on Christ as their Savior. This meeting was on a great racetrack, and it was packed from one end to the other. Then we prayed for the sick after they accepted Christ. It was amazing what took place. The multitude gave praise and glorified God. First to testify was a man who had been blind for 15 years. 
His eyes were totally healed. He could see everything clearly. Next was a man who had been paralyzed, unable to walk for over five years. He was made completely whole. There was a woman who had hobbled about on two crutches. Her family had helped her to the crusade. She was totally healed and paraded back and forth, hoisting her crutches in the air, thousands glorifying God while she marched and praised him. Then all of heaven broke loose when a man who had dragged his body on the ground with his hands for over 30 years was healed and was made whole. He tied old rubber pads on his knees to protect them and used little wooden blocks for his hands to help him move about. His legs looked like poles, but as he walked, they grew. He had been a beggar in the streets, and he was a Muslim. Everyone knew him, and the field of people went wild with joy when they saw him walk. He gave a powerful testimony saying, if Jesus is dead, how could he heal me? You know me. I've accepted Jesus because he is alive. We've never seen a miracle so shake a city. The king knows him well, as every businessman does. It took over an hour to quiet the multitude after hearing and seeing this miracle. While the crowd glorified God, hundreds of others were healed and decided for Christ. Suddenly a woman rushed up to testify she had been a hopeless hunchback. They said she was so disfigured it looked like she had a child on her back. You know the African women carry their babies on their back. She was made straight in a second and the people around her were frightened by the power of God that straightened her back. She was so crippled that sometimes she scooted on the ground rather than to try to stand up enough to walk. The woman was completely restored and straight. It was glorious. A woman who had been blind for eight years received her sight. She cried out, I'm not blind anymore. I can see. You know, that's terrific to hear things like that and see things like that. Several deaf persons were restored, and so many scores of miracles took place that it would take a book to contain them. How great God is. Well, you know, when you see those things year after year, meeting after meeting, for anyone to come around and say Jesus is different or miracles aren't for today, I smile sympathetically and say, buddy, you got to me too late. I've been too far. I've seen too much. You can't peddle that to me. Never. I have compassion for you. Come with me and you will change your song. Hallelujah. I'd like to just share with you a little bit more about this man. This man that crawled on the ground 30 years is a very interesting case. And you know, I often think if the Bible were being written today, no doubt he would be included in it. How many times have we preached about blind Bartimaeus? And sometimes I think we pass over these outstanding cases. I wish I would have had the strength and the time to have recorded more details. Once in a while, a case like him we would get more details, we would have an occasion to talk with them or have the strength or the time. He was one of them. He was a Muslim and his wife was the one that came to the crusade first. And she saw the wonders of God and she just believed that if her husband would come, he'd get healed. Well, he was a devout Muslim and so he wouldn't listen to her. She'd keep coming again, come home and talk to him about it and he'd tell her to not talk about that anymore. One day, he took his whip I don't know, it's sort of customary. A lot of them, they'll carry a whip under their robe because if there's any dogs or any problems, I mean in Africa, I don't mean Muslims as a religion, I mean in Africa, the African ones, because many of them are herdsmen and they're just accustomed to carrying it along. And he took out his whip and he whipped his wife good right in the house. He was crippled, but she obeyed him. And he whipped her and said, don't you ever talk to me about that again. Well, that cut her off. She couldn't. So, he was a professional beggar. You wouldn't know what a professional beggar is in this country. A professional beggar, they have songs they sing, they have monotone, monotonous rituals, phrases that they moan out on the streets. A professional beggar has certain people 
that he will visit at certain intervals and sing his little song or do his little thing and beg. So he made his monthly pass at the king's palace, the Olubaden of Ibaden, the king of the largest tribe in Nigeria. This king was 83 years old at that time. He was a saved, spirit-filled preacher of the gospel, a great old saint. You know, in Africa, polygamy is practiced. I don't mean everywhere, but the biggest part of Africa, polygamy is practiced. Always part of his testimony, he had one wife. His wife was old with him, a precious woman of God, and he was glad for this testimony. Well, the king was the chairman of our crusade. So this was a terrific crusade. Every day, Daisy and I arrived at the crusade grounds in the company of the king. I mean, that's pretty high on the totem pole. <laughs> Did you ever have the king? as your crusade chairman and with his umbrella that a servant would run along and carry over his head and he carried this flask, I don't know what it is, an ivory handle with a bunch of hair, a nice pretty round brush that they wave and it's traditional in Nigeria, probably other parts of Africa and the people always prostrate before the king, always. You say a Pentecostal preacher, a king, a powerful figure and people prostrating before him. Yes, he didn't like it. And he would explain to us, it was embarrassing to him. He'd say, we don't like this, but tribal custom is so deep in our country and in our people, Brother Osborne and Sister Osborne, it takes time. We're gaining. Some of them, sometimes people won't prostrate to me and I feel good when they don't. A precious man of God. But obligated to carry out certain traditions. So here are the people. As we walked in, all the people prostrating before us. Well, what would you do? Would you get mad and fight about it? No, you have to go along and do the best you can. Well, every day the king would open the meeting, make a nice speech, and then go sit down on his nice special chair with a big pillow on it and would sit there like a monarch. Well, to me, like a saint. But he was a monarch. He was a great man. And he would sit there stoic, never showing emotion. A gentle smile once in a while would crack his face that was unmoved. The Muslim came by the king's place to beg for alms. That day, the king didn't send his servant out. The king walked out because the king had a plan. He walked out and met Karimu. And Karimu was shocked. You know, when you're a beggar and the king comes out to give you the alms, instead of sending one of his servants, you better listen, which he did. The king didn't know anything about him having whipped his wife and telling her never to tell him to go to that meeting again. But God knew, and the king was filled with the Holy Spirit. And the king said, Karimu, as he gave him his alms. I have come to tell you today, I'll see you at the crusade, at the racetrack. When the king tells you he'll see you at the crusade, you go to the crusade. <laughs> Maybe the little lady's prayers were answered. Who knows? God does work in wonderful ways, his wonders to perform. That day, Karimu, a devout Muslim, me preaching why did Jesus come? And then within the context of that sermon, I went back to his conception. Why God let him be conceived of the Holy Ghost so his bloodline would be divine? I didn't know about Karimu being there. The Muslims don't believe that. Why did I preach it that day so precisely? Why God let him be born of a virgin? I didn't know Karimu was there. Muslims don't believe he was born of a virgin. But boy, did I preach it that day. Why did Jesus come? How did Jesus come? And that day, as we preached and preached and went right on through his ministry, why 
and his death, why? And his blood, why? And then his resurrection the third day, why? That was my message. See, that's the gospel. I didn't know Karimu was there. Those are all the issues that the Muslims don't believe. Well, when I got to that resurrection part and began to tell how we know Jesus is alive and the things that's happened since he rose from the dead and I am a witness and what I've seen in this country and that country and what's already happened here on this race track, Karimu began to cry. It got to him. See, we can preach it, but it takes the Holy Spirit to change the hearts of people. Preach it. Teach it. Teach it to an individual. Teach it in a hospital. Teach it in a sick room. Teach it anywhere. That same Holy Spirit. You may not feel the jitters. You may not feel hot flashes and cold chills. That's not what counts. The Holy Spirit will always be there. It's His job to give life to the Word. He'll do it when you tell it. Well, that day as we prayed for all of the people, Karimu was out there, 30 years a professional beggar. He said he felt two friends take him by his arms and pick him up and raise him up and hold him up during the prayer. Well, being a reverent, devout Muslim with his eyes closed, praying out, to God and now he'd understood this about Jesus and he was sorting all this out and believing it it made him cry he thought it was nice but his curiosity got the best of him he thought while we were praying he thought he'd like to see who was so kind to help him and he opened his eyes to look and nobody was helping him nobody and that's when he realized that Jesus having risen from the dead had passed his way and had picked him up lovingly and it held him. And he looked down at his legs, and he was standing on them. And I'll tell you, all heaven broke loose. <laughs> Hallelujah. He began to shout and cry, and the first thing, he reached down and unbuckled those rubber pads off of his knees, and he held them in his hands. And his two little wooden things that he used to keep his hands from blistering, that he walked with in his other hand, and waving them, and yelling, and yelling, and coming, running through the crowd, and the people just opening up. It was just like a river through that crowd. The people opened up and glorified God and stood in awe and watched him go by. Cut him. Everybody knew cut him. And he came up the steps and he was waving those things and over to the microphone waving those things. And I'll tell you, he preached the most eloquent sermon on the resurrection I ever heard in my life. Here was his sermon. He said, Jesus must be alive. Look at me. I think that's beautiful. He said, how could I be here if Jesus was dead? See, the Muslims had impressed him in their religion that Jesus was dead, just like Muhammad is dead. But boy, he found out Jesus isn't dead. I've always said it's easy to minister to Muslims. They believe in God. They've got a prophet. His name is Muhammad. They know he's dead. We've got a prophet. His name is Jesus. We know he's alive. All we got to do is prove that our prophet's alive. They can't prove theirs. Is, they don't even want to prove. They know theirs is dead. No argument. Anybody that loves God will trade a dead prophet for a living one. So tell them. They want to hear it. Let it be proven. Karibu was changed. Well, you know, you have the funniest things happen in these meetings. All of a sudden, he turned around and looked at Daisy. He had seen her from a distance, and she preaches about 30 minutes before I preach, and usually MCs all of the meetings. That meeting, the king would always make his introductory remarks and then sit down, and then the meeting would go. He turned around at Daisy and said, Madam Osborne, through the interpreter, he says, give me a new name. What a strange thing. Well, Daisy, quick as she always is. You know, if he'd have said that to me, I'd have went blasé. I wouldn't know what to say. I'd have been swallowed. Just like that. Her eyes fired with love. She said, you shall be called Cornelius. Just like that. I thought, woman, you never cease to amaze me. What are you going to come up with next? Cornelius. You know what he did? 
He went over and fell down on his knees, got down on his knees before the king. We have a picture of him kneeling before the king. The king was seated there, very stoic, but very moved. Wonderful saint of God. He asked the king, is that name all right? The king smiled, said, that name is good. We shall call you Cornelius. Cornelius became a living witness in West Africa. He pledged to the people, I shall not stop until I travel to every town and village where I have begged and show them that Jesus Christ is alive. After that crusade was over, 40 miles away from Ibadan, for the first time in the crusade, we had taken a little drive, borrowed a man's car, and went out to see a little bit of the country. We never get to see the country in two meetings a day. You don't have time to do that. We were up at a very famous town about 40 miles north of Ibadan, and it's a very, very important Muslim town. One of the largest mosques in that area is there. The road goes right by the mosque. As we come over the hill, we saw a great crowd of people out in the road near the mosque. We thought, what is this? I wonder what this will be. As we drove closer, we were coming down a hill so you could see over in the middle of it, all the people were around somebody, and we saw this guy just giving them this. And this is the way he had done it on the crusade platform. I said, Daisy, that's Cornelius as sure as I live. That's Cornelius. We got close. It was Cornelius, he was preaching, he had a crowd, so the crowd found out who we were, and boy was the excitement on. Then they opened up and let us drive the car on in. So we got up on top of the car, got Cornelius up on top of the car, and there we preached the gospel that afternoon, and a whole bunch of Muslims accepted Jesus. I think things like that are terrific. I think it's wonderful to preach the gospel and see it confirmed by signs and miracles and wonders. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. That's the fact of the matter. Cornelius discovered the truth and the truth set him free from dead nerves and the resurrection life of Jesus Christ that we shared with you last week, or was it the week before? I believe the week before. That resurrection life gave new life to Cornelius' nerves and muscles, and he became normal. Two redemptive blessings which Christ brought to the world are salvation and healing. But really those are misnomers. We could say salvation from sin and sickness or healing from sin and sickness. Or we could say, why limited to sin and sickness? We have seven needs. In one of these studies, we'll discuss the seven redemptive names of Jehovah. We have seven needs. There are seven blessings that are a part of salvation, that constitute our salvation, meeting the total need of the total person. When Jesus heals us, when we talk about the ministry of healing the sick, we're talking about the ministry of bringing total wholeness to the total person. It would be incomplete for an unsaved person who is sick in body to be saved from sin and not be healed of sickness after he or she had heard and believed this truth of the gospel. For you to be healed and not to be saved would lack fullness. God wants your spirit to be regenerated when your physical needs are met. Why? Because that's what redemption is. How could you be blessed physically and not be blessed spiritually after you've heard this truth. You discover Jesus as your own substitutionary sacrifice, bearing both your sins and your sicknesses in your place, and you're set free. That truth makes you free. 
This is the truth that sets people free. In our crusades worldwide, we always preach a twofold provision. We tell the unsaved to accept Jesus Christ as both their healer and savior at the same time, to believe that he heals of sickness at the same time he saves from sin, and this brings perfect deliverance to spirit and body alike. Body and spirit are delivered together. <laughs> I always say, when I address theologians, excuse me for this, I always tell them if I can get there first, <laughs> if I can beat you there, they'll get saved and hatch off and be well and never know but what they were supposed to. But if you get there first, I'm messed up. It'll take me about nine passes to get out of them what you got in them. <laughs> Once you prejudice people and once you teach them, God will save you from sins, but God will punish you with his diseases. Big deal. God is a mean God. He'll whip the fire out of you. He'll give you cancer, and it will be a love token in disguise. He will give your Aunt Sally a disease that's terminal and teach all the family to know his love for the family. I don't understand how educated people buy that stuff. I do not for the life of me. I go out to the world, I see heathen people, pagan people all over the world. That's exactly what they teach about their gods. They don't believe their gods are dead, I know they're dead. That's exactly what they teach about their gods. And then I come home and find Christian leaders teach that. I suppose already I've shown too much reaction. Take a lesson from me. You students, don't ever do like I do. Do like I say. <laughs> we must never react. If we react, we're the weaker. And I've already reacted and shown my reaction, and everybody's going to see it. But I'm going to apologize for it. I shouldn't have. We can't get mad at people for preaching what they believe. If we've got something so much better, let's keep smiling and tell what we believe and what God's shown us and what he proves. That'll help people a lot more than getting up and lambasting folks that differ with you. Good lesson for you. Paul says you're bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Well, how do you glorify God in your spirit? By having lots of sin. How do you glorify God in your body? By having sickness. Well, no wonder Jesus said to the man who was sick of a palsy, Son, be of good cheer. Thy sins be forgiven thee. Arise. Pick up thy bed and walk. When he said, your sins are forgiven you, the religious man said, stop that. No, excuse me, I've done that wrong. They didn't say that. They thought that. They thought it. He's got no right to do this. Nobody but God can forgive sins. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, he knows your thoughts, he knows my thoughts, said, you didn't believe when I told him his sins were forgiven because you didn't see anything happen. Okay, I'll show you something you can see. Watch. Because after all, which is easier? To say your sins are forgiven or get up and walk? Which is easier? You want to try it? Say either one. Come and tell him your sins are forgiven. Will that make it so? Come and tell him, get up and walk. Will he get up and walk when you tell him to? That got through. That got through. Isn't Jesus a master? Isn't he a diplomat? Say the one you want to. Try the one. Try him. You want to try him? Nobody tried. Jesus said, okay. You didn't believe when I told him his sins were forgiven because you didn't see anything. But they were forgiven. But I want to show you how I know that and how you can know that. 
that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Watch this. Arise, take up your bed and walk. And he did. He got up. He walked. And he as much as said. Now, you can see that. Okay, it worked, didn't it? For your information, that other worked too. His sins were forgiven. Hallelujah. That's the idea in that story. Jesus came to bring us salvation from our sins and from our sicknesses. And, as I keep saying, from all of the seven needs that we have, all of the seven problems that we are in, salvation is full. Let's just stress one thing to wrap up today's lesson. The word saved in Romans 10 and 9. We read to you, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. 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 And we all interpret that to mean forgiven of your sins. The word saved in Romans 10 and 9 is the same Greek word used by Mark when he said, as many as touched him were made whole. Mark 6, 56, made whole. As many as touched him, wherever they heard he was, they ran throughout the villages, country. Did I tell you Mark 6, 56? They ran throughout the villages, the country, and they began to bring about in beds and in couches the sick, and they laid them in the streets, wherever they heard he was, and they besought him that they might touch, if it were, but the border of his garment. And as many as touched him got saved. Terrific! That's what the book says. Both words saved and made whole were translated from the Greek word sozo. Learn what these words mean in the original. Let me share with you. Let's take a few. Mark 5.23 they besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. Healed. Sozo. Saved. She's dead. Lay your hand on her, and she'll get saved. Terrific. Mark 16, 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be Sozo, saved. Luke 8, 36. They also who saw it told them by what means he that was possessed of the demons was sozo, was healed. Devil possessed guy got saved. Isn't that terrific? This great salvation we must not neglect. The dead girl was raised. She got saved. <laughs> the demon-possessed guy, the devils went out of him. He got saved. Acts 2.21 It shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be sozo, saved. You want some more? Acts 14, verse 9. The same heard Paul speak. This was a guy that was crippled from his birth. Who steadfastly beholding Paul and perceiving that he had faith to be sozo, to be healed. Paul perceived he had faith to be saved. Said, stand up right on your feet. And he leaped and walked. He got sozo. He got saved. Well, that's what Cornelius did. He got saved. Ephesians 2 and 8. By grace are you saved. By grace, unmerited favor, you get sozo. Life from God. Luke 18, 42. And Jesus said unto him, Receive thy sight. You're a blind man. Thy faith hath saved now, there's a strange quirk, a strange twist of the translators. Isn't that interesting that they decided to have this blind man receive his sight and talk about saving him? 
You never can figure out those translators. That's what they did. Okay. Beautiful. That's what it means. But it's surprising that they said that. Thy faith hath saved thee. Your faith has brought sozo to you. Life, Zoe, from God. You've got it. Your eyes can see. All over the world that happens to people. All over the world. I'm thinking of a guy that was blind for five years. He attended two weeks of our meeting before he got healed. Don't have short meetings. Stay till the devil gets tired and quits. He'll leave town in a little while. He'll leave you alone. Just stay till the word dominates everything. Till devils are scared to come out there where you're preaching. If sick people come out there, demoniacs, those demons will run from them before they get there. We've had as many as a hundred outstanding miracles reported at the microphone before we ever opened the service. People tell stories, when I walked on the ground, or when I crawled on the ground, something hit me, and I could stand up and walk. When I came on the ground, I was blind. My eyes opened. The devil would get tired and leave. Well, you hear me say that. It happens. Where was I? You want some more of this? James 5, 5. And the prayer of faith shall... Now, here's another quirk, a funny little twist that the translators gave us. Rather illogical. But listen to what they say. Now, we read it and we never bat an eye. You know, when you read what's ordinary, when you think a thought that's already been thought, you never think it. You just process it. So we've quoted this from King James until we don't even bat an eye when we quote it. But it's really very strange terminology. The prayer of faith shall save the sick. Why didn't it say heal the sick? It says, save the sick. That shows that this word, see, is dancing back and forth there. Sozo. The prayer of faith will bring sozo to the sick people. And the translators just got a whole bunch of words to use. Nice words all. But it's good for us to understand that they all are the same. What it does, it tears down this idea, this good idea, you know, that they say, God will save you, but then you must be patient in your sickness. God will use sickness to train you and bring glory to you and chastise you and use you and teach you patience. That can't be true, folks. It can't be true. Sozo is either sozo or it's not sozo. It's Zoe or it's not Zoe. It's life from God or it's not life from God. If it's life from God, it's for the whole person. You want some more? Mark 5, 34. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Twelve years with a flow of blood. And she got some sozo. <laughs> that stopped her blood flow, and she was made whole. Sozo, Zoe, life from God. It'll always do that. Hallelujah. It'll heal anybody it gets close to. You believe that? You got it in you? You want another? Mark 5, 28. For she said, now here, the same woman. I'm backing up a verse. She said, if I may touch but his clothes, I can get sozo. I shall be whole. And she did, and it worked, and she got it. Here's another one. Luke 17, 19. He said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. He got sozo. The same thing, he that believeth and is baptized shall get sozo. No wonder if I can get there first. <laughs> they get sozo. I hope you get there first, if you believe this. It's tough to go in after the theologians been there that's taught them all this stuff that they're supposed to have patience and all this sickness and stuff. It's tough to get them healed. It's easy if you get there first. They just hatch off, I prove it, by the tens of thousands and tens of thousands of cases. They just hatch off and get well, not before they ever found out they shouldn't. Beautiful. Beautiful. You want another one? Acts chapter 4, verse 9. If we this day be examined of the good deed done unto the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, how he got saved, be it known unto you all that dwell at Jerusalem by the name of Jesus, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand here before you whole. That was Peter's testimony. He got sozo. 
the crippled man at the gate of the temple. When Peter and John took him by the hand and lifted him up, he got sozo. You want another one? Acts 4.12. Neither is there salvation in any other. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby men and women can get sozo. The life of Jesus. Hallelujah. Now another one? Mark 6.56. Wherever he entered into villages or city or country, they laid the sick in the streets and besought him that they might touch, if it were, but the border of his garments, and as many as touched him, got so-so. Hallelujah. Well, praise the Lord. I hope that turns you on. How many would be saved if all we preached about was, maybe it isn't God's will to save you? Perhaps your sin is for God's glory. Perhaps God is using this sin to chastise you. Be patient in your sin until God wills to save you. The day of miracle conversion is past. How many would get saved if that's what we preached all the time? No wonder a lot of people die prematurely. We have a better message. Sozo, the life of Jesus. I'm come that you might have life plenty of it for your spirit and your soul and your body, your whole life. In Jesus' name, I commit this message to you today, and I pray that it grows in you like good seed and purpose from today. I accept it. I shall give it out. God bless you. I'll see you next week.